I'm a mechanical engineering student at the Polytechnic of Namibia. I've spent three years living, working, and uh, most importantly, eating in India, because, well, Indian food is good. And, well, while in India, I was introduced to technology and the way people in India are taking advantage of technology and using it to solve their problems. So today, you're going to go on a journey with me. Uh, when I was younger, I was the guy on the left. Can you see? He has an astronaut suit on, and that was probably you, and the fireman was you. You look right? And, yeah, the... Businessman was probably Dennis because, well, business is important. So today we're going to go on a short journey, emerging technologies, my vision for Africa. So I'm going to give you guys a map of what we're going to do. Well, we're going to start at the beginning, which, which is quite obvious. Uh, after that, we're moving on to the Industrial Revolution and how it affected Africa, catching up, disruption, and then the most important part of my talk, you, because TED is about ideas worth sharing. So I want you guys to live here with a sense of importance, a sense of entitlement to your dreams, your visions, and your ideas. So I'm going to play you a short video clip. In one minute, we're going to see humanity from the very beginning up until this point. Can we please have a video? Okay, so in one and a half minutes, we got to see humanity from the very beginning. The Big Bang Theory, all three evolution, Homo erectus, and up until this point now. We see that initially with history, humans didn't have a fate. But then with time, we see that humanity start taking advantage of opportunities and of the environment. We have specific moments in time where the fate of humanity changed completely. Realizing how to use fire is one of them. But then the one I'm going to focus on in my speech is the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution was a period in time where everything became mechanized. Instead of having 1,000 people in a field working crops, you could have a machine running on oil or petrol do the same job. Now the Industrial Revolution was a period in time where things were happening. Everything was changing. Everything was moving faster. Things were happening at a faster pace. But the problem is, Africa missed the boat. Oh, well, Africans were on the boat, but then we were quite, like, we were on the boats, literally. So then, you see that with Europe and America, you had progressive development, where things were being built up. You see companies that started way back then, and they still exist now. But then in Africa and some of the continents in the third world, so-called third world, uh, you had extractive development where, you know, the best of our able-bodied men was going, our resources were being depleted, and it was just going very bad. Now, I believe this was a pivotal turning point in history because this is where we came at a disadvantage. Before that, we were all living in huts, right? They were all living in mud houses and caves, so everything was chilled. But then after that, now all of a sudden you have machinery in Europe, but then you have mines in Namibia or South Africa, for example. You can see that the scales were quite turned against us. But then it doesn't end here. The next industrial revolution. We move on to the technology revolution. So can I ask, just by show of hand, how many people have phones here? Wait, what, what about you? Oh, okay, yeah, she has a phone too. Now, I was getting worried, I was getting worried. Okay, 
So you have a phone and, well, that's the technology revolution. Thanks to the technology revolution, we are now in a connected world. If I want to get something from China, I no longer have to get a Chinese friend, date the Chinese friend's sister, and then go to China, have a meeting in the house, learn how to speak Mandarin, eat Chinese food, and then find out that the Chinese don't manufacture what I wanted in the first place. Now I can simply use my cell phone, go online, and order it. And within days, it gets to here. Within hours, with the technology I'm going to show you next then. So you can see, this is a picture that went viral on social networking sites. A group of kids given an iPad. Okay, this one's going to be great. I think this is the next Neil Armstrong, like he's really interested. And that guy in the background is just like, okay, what's, what's happening? And this guy is just like, no, it wasn't me. It, it wasn't me. I, I didn't press the button. Okay, now let's look at technology, the applications, and what it has done for mankind. I'm going to show you an idea by a friend of mine from the Technology University of the Delft, and I want you guys to listen attentively. Can we have another video? One one two operator, what is your emergency? It's my dad. I think he had a heart attack. Please help. He's not breathing anymore. Please stay calm. What's your name? Joanna. Good. Joanna, we've got your location. The ambulance drone is on its way. We remove his top shirt to uncover his torso. Uh, okay. Great. Can you go to the nearest exit? The ambulance drone is almost there. Okay. I'm outside. I'll be talking through the drone now, so you can put down the phone. Now please pick up the drone and bring it to your father. You're doing great. Okay, pull the green lid. Now place the pads on your father's chest. Good, I can see that the pads are properly applied. Joanna, please stay clear of your father. We'll take it from here. The ambulance drone design is a project by Alec Momond, a friend of mine from the Technological University of the Delft. Now I want all of you to all close your eyes. Like close your eyes, I'm watching you. And just imagine with me. Imagine you're in Okaku, which is a rural village in the north of Namibia. You fall ill. The nearest hospital is 20 kilometers away. Your donkey has died because of the recent drought, so you can't go there with your donkey. Well, you don't have a car because there are no roads. If you've been to Okaku, you know what I mean. It takes a while. You're dying like dead, dead. <laughs> but then 20 kilometers away, you have an ambulance drone that can get to you almost immediately. No traffic rush. And if you've been in the streets of Vendouk at 5 p.m., you understand what I mean by no traffic rush. No traffic rush, no hassles, and no roads required. Within two minutes, the drone is sitting right next to you. And the first aid kit is delivered, and you get to live. So these are some of the university projects I've worked on while in India. I wasn't just eating. I was also working, guys. So that's me, when I used to look much more fit and cooler and all handsome. Uh, that's Junaid. And this is one of my professors from university. That's during a Boeing competition that we won. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this was a project I was working on in university. Imagine you have a disaster. The telecommunication systems are knocked out. You're under a collapsed building. There's no way for you to contact people and tell them, hey, I'm in the toilet and the building crashed on me. Please come and save me before I pin my pants. Now, how are rescue professionals going to get to you? How are you going to tell them to come to the right places? Well, with this project, we built a drone that could be used as a data transfer device. As soon as you have an emergency or a crash or a catastrophe and you don't have telecommunication systems, the drone comes in, flies around, 
And whatever text messages or calls you're making, it immediately transfers them to the network. So that means even you with your normal Tamagotchi or Katoch phone, as we like calling them in Namibia, will be able to keep in touch even after the towers have been knocked out. Now, this was successfully tested in West Bengal, and we see great initiatives. I'm hoping for a project to be jump-started in Namibia too. Let's work on it. Let's network. Another awesome project is the Plastic Cool Bags by Tim Retaka. So Tim Retaka saw this dilemma. In rural villages, kids often walk an average of 20 kilometers to get to and fro school. Now, you have three main problems. The first, if they're walking in the early hours, they're not visible enough. In South Africa alone, three children die every day on their way to school because of motorists that either can't see them or for any other reason. Secondly, well, they don't have bags. If you've been to villages in rural Namibia, you'll see kids walking to school and having their books in plastic bags. And we can't tolerate this. It's the 21st century. And in the third part, after walking 20 kilometers from school, trying to tell me that you're going to go home and use that one last candle that your family had rationed for the next week to study. No, we need light. Your studying can wait. You can go tend the kettle anyways. Now, Retaka came up with this awesome initiative where they recycle plastic bags and turn them into school bags. So they compress and apply heat. The process is very fancy and very complicated, so I'll, I'll save you the details. And then they put a solar battery and the solar panel on the bags. So as the children are walking to school, they charge the batteries. And as soon as they get home, they're able to use the lights for studying. So think about it. After traveling two hours from school, you have a charged battery, you have a lamp. Now all of a sudden, you're able to do your homework. Which is a problem because then when you go to school the following day, you don't have an excuse anymore. <laughs> hey, it's rough, hey, it's rough. Let's look at another idea. Two weeks ago, I was invited to attend the Brightest Young Mind Summit in South Africa, Joburg. So it's a collection of 100 youth that come together, think of innovative ways to solve Africa's problems. At this summit, I met up with Sabelo Sibanda, who developed solar power tablet PCs. Imagine giving tablet PCs to the Ovahimba community in northern Namibia. Now they have access to applications like Google. Now you've given the Himba community access to the same information that the president of America didn't have in 1960. Imagine empowering on such a scale. But then there's a problem. You know, us as humans are very pessimistic. I think we all have that auntie at home who sits in the corner and talks about how bad everything is. Everything is becoming expensive. Everybody is dying. Ah, the world is going bad. Wait, am I the only one with such an aunt? Okay, we all have that one. But in actual fact, the world is becoming a much better place. We see here that you're going to live two times longer than somebody who was born in the year 1900. And the birth rate per thousand has decreased drastically. So then the world is becoming a much better place than we thought it was. Now, the reason most of you will have phones today is because, well, they were cheaper than they were back then. And this is because of Moore's Law. Well, in simple English, Moore's law means everything is becoming faster and it's becoming cheaper when it comes to electronics product. So then you have a phone now for 335 that you would have had for 430 American dollars in 2008. So the average global smartphone pricing trend is that at an average annual rate of 5%, there's a time when smartphones are going to become virtually free. They're going to cost you nothing. No zak, as we call it in the Kasi, in the location. Now, what does this mean to you as an individual? This means that the tools are now in your hands. Before, we had to depend on large multinational corporations with the hundreds of offices in all cities around Africa and the world and the hundreds and thousands of employees. They were the only ones that could actually impact change. But then we see that the trend is slowly getting better. We see that now one person with an awesome idea and the following can actually make things happen. We take the example of the affirmative repositioning, which is close to home. Just go on Facebook, guys, we need land. And soon or later, you have a following. Let's take the Kodak example. So, well, Kodak was this awesome big company that made photo cameras. So, at 2012, Kodak was bankrupt. Zero Namibian dollars, which if you exchange it is also zero American dollars. And it had a peak number of 145,000 employees. 
Instagram, on the other hand, with only 18 employees, was valued at $1 billion. Imagine. Now, how long does it take you to get to $1 billion? The average Fortune 500 company takes 20 years to get to a billion dollars. Uber, which is changing the role of transportation and taxi in the world, took two years. WhatsApp, which we all should have, if you don't, hey, hey, you're in trouble, took two years, and Oculus Rift, which hasn't even gone for mass production, took only one year. How long is your company going to take to reach the billion dollar mark? Well, then, if we follow the curve, ah, within a day, huh? within a day. Just gonna like get here. Okay, now we're getting to the most important part, the end of our goal. And you see just like far there, top of my nose. Ah, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go faster, faster. Okay, so how do you change the world? Well, firstly, you have to be bold. Not, not the hairstyle, I mean like you have to be bold and courageous. We look at the example of Steve Jobs, the inventor of the iPhone. Well, nobody really wanted an iPhone back then because they didn't know what it was. But he was bold. He saw what the market needed and he went straight for it. You have to be innovative. Anybody can open up a spaza shop on the side of the road or open up a bottle store in a place. It's, it's something everybody can do and it doesn't necessarily solve problems. In South Africa, Sabelo once told me, a good friend of mine, that every second person has an NGO. That's not what we need. We need innovative solutions to our problems. A third point, go back to first principles. An expert is somebody who's there to tell you something cannot be done because there's no market research for it. They don't have examples of cases where it's worked. So if you're going to come up with your innovative new idea of providing tablets to the Ovahimba community, you're going to be told it can't be done. But if you go back to first principles, where you look at figures of how tablets have influenced other communities that aren't the Ovahiba, but it might be the same socioeconomic stance, then, well, you have a much better chance of making it. Solve, tomorrow's problems with, solve today's problems with tomorrow's technology. You're not going to get things right on the first try. But if you test, you go on, you test, you go on, you're going to find a solution. So one last point. While in India, in the state of Tamil Nadu, there's this bread we call a roti that you roll up. It's circle. So when men are looking for a wife to go marry, they go look for the wife that makes the rounders roti. So what's your round roti? What's that one thing you can provide to Africa that's innovative and that nobody else can do? Once you find that, start rolling. Let's go. Thanks.